Hi, welcome to the University of Montana Buddy DeFranco Jazz Festival. I'm Rob Tapper, Director of Jazz Studies, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to be part of this month-long jazz educational event in our new format. Thanks for taking advantage of all the wonderful jazz educational videos we have to offer you. Special thanks to Heather Adams for all her work in making this happen. You're about to see a phenomenal masterclass by one of our guest artists, trumpet player, educator, Dr. Scott Belk from the University of Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. You're going to love it. Enjoy. There you go. Hello from Cincinnati. My name is Scott Belk, and I'm the Director of Jazz Studies at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, CCM, where I direct the jazz orchestra and teach applied jazz trumpet. I'd like to share with you a few things that have helped me in my professional career and uh, as in my development as an artist, and we'll hit a few topics, and uh, hopefully this will be some information that will uh, help you along your way, and uh, we'll have some fun in the interim. The first thing I'd like to cover today is the concept of flexibility, and uh, that's something that's near and dear to my heart as uh, I have a couple of books out on the topic and their method books. I've spent a lot of time thinking about flexibility and uh, getting around musically on the instrument. And for a lot of people, when you look at flexibility, when they think about flexibility, it's lip slurs. They're basically diatonic exercises that everyone in one way or another is compelled to play or practice to, to cover the basic technique of getting around the, the instrument uh, musically. So uh, the things that you would do to uh, play a, any kind of a lip slur or a flexibility exercise, they apply to the things that I do. But uh, And so why don't we maybe start from that standpoint and look at what it, uh, is required to practice and hone this particular skill. When, um, when we sit down to play, obviously we're trying to make a great sound. We're trying to uh, play beautifully and we're trying to play under control. And we have to be able to practice in such a way that we don't really break down our chops. So being able to... Uh, uh, practice flexibility is like any other technique or any other music that you're going to practice. You need to be able to figure out a way to do it in a non-destructive, kind of sustainable uh, fashion so that uh, when you get done practicing flexibility, you don't need a huge uh, break afterwards, take a little bit of time off, and we figure out how we can go about this. And these principles apply to everything that we're going to do. So we want to make sure that we're uh, practicing in in a way that I call chop neutral. In other words, we're playing with just enough uh, support and just enough volume to get everything to happen easily, but no more. And that's part of the process of what we'll talk about right now. So when uh, when you play any any uh, basic flexibility or a lip slur, and for those of you who are joining us that maybe don't aren't familiar with the term lip slur, a lip slur is just getting from one note to the next that uh, in a combination that is is uh, the same. So without uh, you know just a, by way of demonstration, a typical lip slur would would be something like out of the Earl Irons book, uh, the Twenty Eight Groups from I can't remember what year it is, and I want to say it's the fifties. In any case, this, this idea. idea. Something along those lines, you'd uh, progress through the seven fingering positions that, of course, correspond, by the way, they correspond to the trombone uh, positions. And they go up by half step, or down by half step in this case. And so forth. So the idea behind 
doing any any type of uh, flexibility like this is to maintain a certain disposition towards the instrument or uh, an attitude that you have in the way you interface with the horn. So I want to to be able to do these with lots and lots of repetitions in a way that's non, like I mentioned before, kind of non-destructive. So to do that, I have to set up some per, some basic parameters. So the first place we go to learn flexibility or learn about flexibility is in, in the Arban book. And uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Arban, if you don't have his book, you need to get it uh, if you're going to be a serious player and a student of, of what we do. And uh, the Arben method, I think it's on page 42, at least of my edition, the, the Arben method has the sort of first written lip slurs for the cornet. And we're talking the 1860s, the early 1860s. So this, this concept has been around for quite some time. In any case, what, uh, what um, uh, Arben does in, in the course of his studies is to go chromatically through the positions up from G and uh, to do it in a way that uh, slowly, uh, well, actually incrementally, amps up the, the uh, rhythmic subdivision. So you start with half notes, I believe, maybe whole notes, and then go through uh, quarter notes, eighth notes, eighth note triplets, sixteenth notes, and then uh, sextuplets. So the, f um, the progression is along these lines. I'll just uh, sh some short uh, demonstrations. And then we'll talk about why, uh, how we approach this in a way that um, makes this technique easier to play and, uh, and actually has a uh, more of a, a close relation to the, everything else that we're going to do. So by way of demonstration, the type of thing that we're talking about is, is pretty simple, like this. And those would continue up to the top of the staff and then back down. Um, some of them use uh, some, uh, a couple of the different alternate fingerings. And uh, those just serve to uh, add some of the, the, the possible intervals that are, that are in, inherent in the, in the construction of the, of the cornet and the trumpet. So in any case, when, when we set up the way we're going to play these uh, physically and sort of the disposition that we have mentally towards doing this, we want to kind of step back and be able to pay attention to what's happening behind the body or behind the horn in the body. So uh, I've heard this is uh, referred to as behind the bell consciousness. And it's basically taking the time. I don't have to think about the notes. Taking the time to um, kind of reset your focus and your awareness and pay attention as if you're from the camera view of yourself and to see what it feels like and looks like in your body. So I'm, 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 I've got several check mark types of uh, things that I'm going to do here. So one of the things as you're learning this technique, and, and I, I always like to, to tell this to my students, is that a, a lot of techniques are very difficult and they require a, a great deal of time to master. And some of them um, less so. It just depends on the individual. And this is, uh, flexibility can be one of those techniques that actually is extremely difficult when you can't do it. And then when you figure out kind of how to do it, it gets much easier, much faster. So it's not a linear progression where it just gets, or maybe it gets easier. It's like if you're coming downhill as, as you're doing it gradually. Once you kind of figure out how these things work, you can get around pretty quickly. So the first thing that I do when I'm thinking about flexibility is I want to make sure that I'm, I'm paying attention to the airstream and that I'm, I'm feeling in my body for what I call a push or a, uh, a, a case where I'm trying to, as I'm playing, leaning into the, into the, um, into the note. So when you're learning how to, uh, how to do flexibilities, the first thing that you'll notice is it feels like there's a wall or a ceiling between the note that you're on and the note you're trying to go to. All right. Now, to, to bypass it or to get through that, we feel like we have to kind of pound our way through. And to a degree, that's true, but there's also maybe a strategy that we can do that we can sneak up on it. And, you know, so there, there more, there's more than one, one way to skin a cat with this. But what I'm talking about here is the feeling in the body and, and what I would recommend to a student or to, uh, to anybody that's trying to get better at this is 
is you want to feel back here. You put your if you put your hand on your chest, on or on the top of your abdomen, right right around your sternum and everything like that. And as you go up, what I'm feeling for is is, is a sort of a, a sudden movement, a movement where I'm pushing to get the next note. And there's everyone's got a spot where they feel like they need to do that, and your job is to figure out how to get through that. Uh, basically, it's not, not exactly a break, but it's, a, it's an area where you have to push through where the pressure that you need for the bottom note or the note before it is, uh, is much less seemingly than the, for the note that you're going to. So what I want to watch for and feel for is this. Where you'll see that type of a uh, of a movement in a uh, in a student or in yourself. So so what we're doing is actually you can you can video it or you can practice in in um, with a partner and you can watch for this. A lot of times you're going to see somebody visibly see them do a push in their body. So what has to happen in, in to or one of the things that has to happen to make this actually work. Is is to have a really solid sense of what the what you're doing with the air in terms of support. Now, support is a, a wonderful word, and it's used to uh, describe what we're doing or how we're acting upon the airstream within our body. I think it's also one of the types of words that falls into the category of very poorly understood and even more poorly described by a lot of teachers and um, and it's it's something that we start to hear from the minute we get our instrument. You got to support your air. Use your air. Support your air. Uh, so sometimes you'll get uh, you'll get uh, uh, sort of advice, advice that, that you, know, you have, have to tense your your abdomen. You have to do various things in, within your body, and and these are true, or they they may be true to a degree, but I think it's important for us to be aware of what we're actually trying to do when we're supporting air. So what are we doing when we support air? What is the point of, of quote-unquote, supporting the air? Um, I would, if this were a live uh, session, we would have a chance to talk about, I would ask questions to students and say, well, you know, what are, we, what are we thinking about when we're saying support your air? And, um, you know, basically to, to kind of cut to the chase, when we're supporting air is we're basically pressurizing the air. We're acting upon the air that's inside the lungs by adding pressure from muscles in, in, the, um, in the chest and in the abdomen that create a, 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 an energized and pressurized air. And, and so when we think about that, uh, sometimes we'll, we'll get an analogy to, to blow air. And, and blowing air is like if you're blowing out a candle, if you think about that, you, you get something like this. <sighs> And, and if you grafted it, it would sort of look like a, it would, it would have a, a drop off. So for flexibility studies to work or for technique or for any kind of musical production to really work, we have to be able to create a steady airflow. And that steady airflow has to be, it has to be able to uh, endure just or maintain while we're moving around the instrument. So it, it might be something as simple as playing a, a long note, a long tone. Behind the horn, again, we're talking about an air stream that doesn't know the difference between these two notes. So as I'm playing there, the perception that I have behind the horn is... Same thing for when the extra note is added for the third. And so forth. So if I continue up to the fifth... So, so what's really happening when we're supporting air? Well, I don't know um, exactly what is happening. I can only describe to you what I had to do to figure out how to 
make the support uh, concept work for me, and I'll I'll give you a brief description of of how it um, how I came about this at least. One of the issues that I had as a uh, as a young student or as an older student even was getting uh, resonance in tongued notes to get a pop. on uh, individual notes that would be tongued and staccato or have some sort of separation. And eventually I figured out, and it was like way, way later in, in my career, that uh, what I could do to make that work was to simulate basically uh, a, a, an aerosol can of pressurized air and that I'm releasing air. But the air itself is held in and pressurized. So I will, I'll give you a, a, we'll try to do this. I've never done this by way of a, a virtual uh, masterclass, but I'll ask you to do this and see if you're able to do this. And I'll describe it to you as we're doing this. You can do it at home and, and it works quite well. So the first thing we'll do is uh, we're going to practice holding our breath. It's pretty simple. Take a big breath in and hold it. release. Okay. And um, so now what we're going to do is um, I want you to take the breath in and you're going to hold it. And I'm going to talk to you while you are holding that breath. Okay. So ready. So breathe in, breathe in and hold it. Now you should be holding your breath. And what I want you to do is not pass out, first of all, but secondly, I want you to force, actually let the air out. Okay. I'm going too long. All right. So breathe in, hold it, take a full tank. All right. Now I want you to force the air out, but don't let it out. So in other words, push on the air as if you're going to let it out, but don't let it out. Okay. Now release. You've released the air. You probably had a little bit more uh, uh, energy behind it, a little bit more pressure behind it. Now, holding your breath is something that you're not supposed to do. It's something that is routinely uh, considered a no-no. It's, it's not, it's not, uh, not something that we want to be especially encouraging students to do. And there are good reasons for saying you should never hold your breath. I used to hear that when I was coming up and, and to that sort of advice, I, I would always ask, why not? Now the, the, uh, the answer to that is, I think there's, there's a general consensus that, uh, if you hold your breath before an entrance, there's a, there's a ten tendency to have a, uh, to grip or to, um, to have a, like a vowel salva, like, you know, like a, a, a sudden explosion. And I think we're trying to avoid that. So generally on the inhale, the inhale is taught and the exhale is taught as one continuous sort of motion. So, like that. So, um, but that's fine, but what if I have to play a note that's an octave up, or if I have to get between two notes that aren't so close together? Now we have to start thinking about some strategies that are going to keep us from doing a lot of the things like, you know, doing that sudden push. So if we go back to the idea of not holding our breath um, and then saying, well, maybe we can hold our breath. And so I would ask you if you say, well, you shouldn't hold your breath, what's happening here between the notes? Well, what's obviously happening is you're not releasing air, you're not breathing in, you're holding your breath. So we hold our breath in one form or another through many, many types of uh, musical phrases. So now maybe we can use that concept to actually uh, improve or energize or pressurize the air that we're going to use. So let's uh, go back to where we just were with taking in a full breath, holding it, pressurizing it. And then also I'll have you do that. And then I want to give you one further uh, uh, piece of uh, instruction. So take the breath in, hold it, force here as if you're going to push it out. Now do not release the air, but open your mouth. Now release. release. All right. Now, what was just happening? You were holding your breath and your mouth was open. So, okay, you don't need to have a, a closed chops 
to maintain the internal pressure that we're going to use for this, this concept, all right, or for our basic concept being how we're going to support air and how that support is actually going to make our job easier. So when we get into all of this, as we get into all of it, the real um, bonus for all this is that it's going to make everything, hopefully, easier to produce. And when I say everything, I mean musical lines, all right? So... If we continue now and we think, all right, well, how am I going to use that to create the energy or how am I going to practice it? Here's a simple, uh, this is what I was just doing before. And I would say, uh, I want to um, have you just play a few notes uh, with, uh, maybe play them back. If you're in a place that you can play, play them back to me. And the, con the concept one more time is going to be, we'll play them on a G, is that I'm going to take the breath in, I'm going to pressurize it, and then I'm going to... And that's the actual sound that I'm conceiving of the little spray, the aerosol spray. And it's a... Now, when I'm doing that, my tongue is coming back up to the top. So in other words, my, I feel like uh, the, the tongue comes down. But when I play the notes that I'm about to play, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go... So my tongue from my roof of my mouth is coming down and the end of the note is going to be open. So if we try it that way, you take a breath in, hold it, and... Play it back. Hopefully, in the course of this demonstration, you can hear some of the resonant quality that I'm getting when I'm able to get that puff, that initial release of air into the note, all right? So, um, when it happens, I, it's almost like hitting a timpani. You get a little bit of a ring to it, and you leave the note open at the end. So, this pressurized air is something that I'm going to, I'm going to really want to be able to use all around the horn, regardless of what I'm practicing. So, again, if I go back to a chromatic scale or if I go to a Clark study, any of those things, I'm going to just uh, have that basic kind of body set that allows me to have pressurized air at my disposal. So, if you want to think about it, that feeling that you get when you have to, we have that body push. <laughs> is where where the the body is is having to suddenly it's like the gas uh, pedal on on a car where you're cruising along and all of a sudden you need to be at a different uh, different speed all of a sudden it doesn't work because you need to you need to actually have the the rpms are already in the bank to to, to get to the, to the, the faster speed so if we go we get a hesitation if we if we just put the uh well, at least if you have a car like mine. So, anyway, so if we go back to the concept of flexibility, which in a manner of speaking is going to underlie everything that we're going to do because we have to be flexible to get from one note to the next. If we go back to that concept and say, well, what, what does it look like and what does it feel like when we're, we're taking that body set, we're supporting the air, we're pressurizing the air, and then we're actually starting to move around in a way that, you know, that we would call a, a, a lip slur or whatever. So all of a sudden now we go from... Now, um, basically behind the horn... We want to have a, a consistent sort of feel. And as I'm doing that, and as I'm going to do the rest of the demonstration for you today, um, back behind the horn, it's like this. There's not a sense of any kind of movement really going on in that. And the way that you know, and this is something that was going to go for any of our practice, but the way that you know you've really got this technique starting to, you know, at least be under your fingers and under your chops, 
and into your wheelhouse is that you're going to have really good metric control. You're going to be able to do this in time with a metronome and it's going to be something that you feel like you have control over and you can, you can, um, it's not something that is going to occupy all of your bandwidth. It's just a skill. It's skipping over that, um, into that land where the, the technique becomes relatively simple and easy to do. There's always going to be a more advanced version or a, a more advanced, uh, or more difficult t a musical passage for us to tackle that's going to present real difficulty and real challenges. But if these basics are under uh, control and are, are foundational to our playing, it's going to make everything we do, we're going to have a much more uh, uh, solid process for learning new repertoire, whether it's jazz, lead, classical, solo, chamber, it doesn't matter. These, these, this way of playing is, is, is uh, foundational. All right. So now we look at uh, covering a little bit more uh, range with the, the exercises that we're doing. And we still want to have the, 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 uh, um, the feeling that everything behind is relative, behind me saying in the body is relatively still. And that what we're doing is, is has a freeness and, and is not wearing us out. Okay. Now, part of the way that I maintain fresh chops is I, when I practice, I'm, I'm a militant user of a timer, and I mainly use the timer for my breaks. So I, ma I make sure that each thing that I practice is part of my regular routine. I've got a regular timed interval that I take off. So if I do some flow studies, a little Chickowitz, If I go through that whole sequence, I take two minutes off. Now, two minutes is a long time, but by taking more time than I need at the beginning, I stay fresher longer in my practice um, regimen. So I'm not, most people tend to practice themselves out and they get more and more tired as they play. So I find the, the basic uh, premises from the, uh, the Kenyan runners um, who, distance runners, who ran, who ran uh, what they call negative splits in the marathon. So the idea behind uh, the way, way that most Westerners, Westerners would run a marathon would be to divide 26.2 miles by how fast you want to go and then make each mile the same. And what the Kenyan runners were uh, doing way before anybody else thought of this, it was they were saying, well, no, that all has to add up to this uh, particular number or time. But the initial miles in, in a marathon would actually be slower so that the last ones can be faster. All right. So it's sort of a, a real, uh, real life demonstration of it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And if, if uh, road running and racing is any indication um, and any relation to practicing, which it really is a good analogy, most people start too fast. And once you start too fast, you're done. All right. So back to where we are. We've taken some time. We're looking at some of the next levels of things that we can do to improve our, our playing on, uh, on the instrument to make what we do, make the music that we play easier and easier. So um, I'll give you a, a next, uh, the next thing that I'll demonstrate is a, an exercise from my first book, uh, Modern Flexibilities for Brass. And if you're interested in those, uh, either of my books, they're both out and they've been out for a while. And uh, just Google my name and uh, uh, flexibilities, and that's, uh, that's a, a good place to start. But in any case, the, uh, the first exercise in, in my, my first book is called the Cincinnati Facial. And I'll uh, give you a little kind of a, uh, abbreviated version of it, okay? <laughs> Okay, so that is uh, covers a, a good bit of range uh, out of the gate. I'm basically taking a couple of different partials and I'm in, I'm combining them and putting them in a, in a in in three, 
and uh, trying to create a flexibility exercise that has a little bit more of a musical uh, uh, sort of a, a musical disposition to it or whatever, or something that sounds like it would be actual music as opposed to an exercise. And um, so when I practice something like this, and when hopefully when you practice something like that, um, we go back to some of these principles that I was just talking about. And we start to layer in a couple more kind of crucial concepts for how we're going to practice flexibility and how we're going to eventually practice anything that we're doing. All right. So as um, if, if I look at this particular set of intervals, I have... And if I were to cue a student to play that, I would cue it like this. And if, if you played it like that, so when we play anything or we practice anything, we're essentially giving ourselves a test. Here's the test. Can I play this? If I can play it or get through it at all, if it's not even close, I just got to keep kind of uh, grinding away at it and get it close to where I can even consider it. A, a, a test or at least a portion of it that I can sort of test myself out on. And, uh, and I want to ask myself this main question. If I've just done that, I can't do it that way. If I've just done that, I have to ask, am I done? And I have to have a good way to grade that, uh, what I just did. And uh, I have to answer some questions to know if I'm done. Do I need to do that again? Otherwise, if you don't know whether you need to do it again, um, you know, your practicing is going to be somewhat in vain because you practice things until they're done, right? Until they're, you're done practicing because they have gotten better. Now, they may not be perfected on that day, but we have to have at least a, a handle on the process of making them closer to our goal. So, I want to come back to that question and say, do, uh, are we finished? Have we just completed that? I would ask a couple of different questions. Now, these questions would be, number one, that I hit all the notes. Yeah. Okay. So that's a yes. Good. All right. Um, good sound. Well, for, for what we're doing, yeah, good enough, I think. Uh, that's what I sound like. I don't think there's much I could do at the moment to, to change my tone. Um, then I ask again, am I done? And that's where I think a lot of people go off the rails when they're practicing. Because if you answer those questions to the affirmative and you say, well, you know, I, yeah, I can play that. I, I, and that can, oh, the other question that I, I, I forgot was, could I do that 10 times out of 10 with the same result? And the answer would be yes, I could do that 10 times out of 10 with the same result. And so then, then the question comes, yeah, am I done? Well... Am I? You know, you'd have to ask yourself that question every every day, and uh, and the answer is no. I'm not done. I, I'm not done because I I have a a way of maybe making that even better. Okay, and for me, I'll know it's better when those notes that I cued start to get closer together. All right. So we're going to compress, or I'm I'm interested in compressing the musical line to where. I can navigate between the pitches, and it doesn't feel like I'm going way high or, or way low. All right. So, as I said, when I did this, this, uh, when we conceive of that um, that way, if it feels like those intervals are large intervals, then they are, and I'm going to play them in a way that makes them feel like they're the perceptually they're they are big intervals. They're already fifths, right? Fourth, and then another fourth. Okay, so my repetitions are going to be refining repetitions. That's an important concept in, in how I practice and how I teach. The idea of refining repetitions so that at each repetition that I do, hopefully if I can do them in a way that's circular, great, that things are going to get a little smoother and a little bit closer together. All right. The refining repetition is like if you were going to build a table out of wood and you were going to come out and you were going to sand the table. 
And when you're sanding the table, you're trying to make the surfaces smooth. So what you would do is you would sand and then you would take your hand and you would feel to feel if the grain is, is feeling smooth yet. And then after, if you think, well, no, that's not really that smooth yet. And then you sand a little bit more and, and you, you continue, continue that process until the surface is smooth. That's how the process works for anything that we're, we're, uh, we're practicing. Do you have control over it? Is it smooth yet? When you're sanding a surface, um, you don't sand for, you know, 20 seconds and go, it's still rough. Oh, pff, I suck. It should be, it should be smooth by now. Um, you know, why isn't it smooth? Well, you know, what's his face, man? When he, he only sanded for five minutes and he was done with the whole table. But my table's taking me forever. Well, it doesn't really matter how long your table is taking to be sanded. You just sand it until, and everybody's table is a different size. So between that and uh, their sandpaper being uh, out of uh, out of grit or a different kind of grit, um, but that's for a different day. So in any case, if I come back to this basic concept of getting around the horn with uh, a, a smaller interval, what I do is I want to think in terms of the notes being so and i'm doing that by going the smallest smallest possible physical distance and mental distance between the notes. And the way that I practice that and the way that I think about it all revolves around the, the idea of making that close together and thereby easier to play. The, the smaller distance that you have, the easier the line is going to be. And you're going to feel it in your body, and it's going to feel that you've got control over the line. To do that is no small feat, but that's the idea. You have to be going in, a, in, a, in that direction to even have a, have a chance at it. And so for you, if you want to practice this concept with something a little bit more simple, and this is one of the things that I do at, a, at my regular master classes, is just to take... Um, three pitches like this C, G, and C. And those three pitches, as you, uh, as you play them, same kind of deal. Are they that really that far apart or are they? All right, so it's, it's easy at this point, but I'm also taking lots of rest, and I've been practicing it for many, many years. I wish I would have known to, to look at the instrument this way and the musical line in this way, because it's, it's made learning music much more interesting and fun. All right, so when you want to try this with those three notes, the way that I would take you through this process and the way I do it with my students is, is to t play the first note, the principal note, and then go descend to the next pitch the smallest distance possible and then be ready to pop right back up. So what you're going to do is kind of keep your position for the C. And you work that interval until you can make it start to feel like it's closer to the top. Then, then when you go down to the low C, we won't even call it a low C, we'll just call it to the octave. Same deal, you would go from the G, but you're, the whole time you're keeping the position for the C. Now, behind all of that, still supported pressurized air. Uh, I'm not necessarily gripping and super tensing, 
But at the same time, I want to make sure that what I'm doing has energy and it's already stored potential energy um, that's ready to convert itself into uh, more direct kinetic energy that is able to get me from one note to the next. This is the type of practice or the type of body feel that you get when you're practicing something like the Haydn and you have... You're not going... You're just... Connecting those notes and making them as close as possible without having to have that body push. So if I'm practicing the Haydn, which I haven't done in 13 years, I do a little demo on it every now and again like this, but in any case... I have pressurized air, supported air all behind that, and I'm not having to go... So, that's a lot of information that I've thrown at you right there, and um, but the concepts are things that were not presented to me, or were not presented clearly, at least to me, um, or at least to my capacity that I was able to, to get them along the way, and I kind of had to figure them out using this language. But the vehicle flexibility is, is, is just one way to get around the horn. But the foundational way of playing and practicing, the circular effortlessness that we're going for, is something that um, we can do immediately and we can have an expectation of ease of production of the musical line. If the line is easy, then the music can be fun. We can phrase it the way we want to. We can play it in tune with somebody else. We can uh, follow a conductor. We can do many other things. Maybe we can improvise with the material that if we're jazz players, or maybe we can take it up an octave, or we can put a little zip on it, or phrase things differently. We have choices because the music is not so difficult to play. So if you'll take this concept and um, think about it as a way of mastering the music that you're practicing in the moment and making it easy. The mastery is what makes it easy and predictable and consistent. So I uh, hope that helps. I'm going to actually do one more, um, one more little demonstration here in a second. But take that concept and see what you can do if it works in your own practice. The... I know it works for me and it makes my practice sessions much more enjoyable and it really gives me a strategy for working on music. I hope this helps and And I'll be back back in just a second second to demonstrate one other aspect of flexibility that will help with your upper register. And finally, I'd like to share with you a concept that has been instrumental, no pun intended, in uh, helping me explore and develop my upper register as a young professional. And uh, this is a concept of slotting, which was shown to me many years ago by Dominic Spera at the uh, at uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, and also taught to me a little bit more in depth by Vincent DiMartino. Uh, somebody who is uh, both of whom are wonderful or uh, wonderful lead players and uh, spectacular upper registers. I'll give you some more information uh, on my web. There is more information on my website regarding this and uh, with a complete demonstration of this, but I'll give you a little teaser for it. And so slotting is fairly simple. It is taking two partials or taking a lip slur and making it extremely mechanical. We do these above the staff going up and they're the opposite of a traditional slur. The traditional slur we want to be smooth and connected and it should not sound like it's being tongued but a, uh, a slot or slotting exercise or, or a line that slots is going, going to, to be slurred, slurred but it's going to have a very pronounced pop at the front of the, the note that is going to make it sound almost as if it's tongued. So if we're playing my Wild Irish Rose um, out of the Arben book. A, uh, an interpretation of those slurs are going to be a, a very liquid connection. Uh, that's not what we're going to do here with slots. With slots, what we're going to do is we're going to go navigate between two partials 
and then add a third and a fourth and a fifth. And at each step of the way, uh, we're going to try to get those partials to click or slot. They're going to have a pop at the beginning of the note. So it'll be something like this. Okay, so I'm going to take a knee right now and uh, try to not pass out. Actually, that's not too bad. But uh, the, uh, the point of what I'm doing, hopefully you could pick that up on the recording, is really getting the notes, uh, the transition between the notes to, be, to pop or to slot. I have to go slowly enough that I can make those slot and, and make sure that I can hear the pop. Again, what I talked about earlier is we don't want to feel like we're having to push within our body to make these things happen. All right, so as I go up the register, I'm listening for the slot, and I'm listening for where it starts to slide. Anyway, that's a little bit of that. Like I said, I've got a more in-depth discussion of slotting on uh, my website, scottbelk.com. More information about some of the flexibility um, uh, concepts that I've uh, introduced today. And also, uh, I also have a blog called trumpetshed.com, uh, and I've got some, some articles on there that perhaps you'll uh, find of interest. But hopefully some of these concepts have been helpful for you. And uh, um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. And you can find my contact information on my website. And uh, again, thanks to the University of Montana for uh, inviting me to do this as part of their um, annual jazz festival. Hopefully I can come out there. It's been a long time since I've been out in, in Montana. So it's beautiful out there. I'd hope to love to come out and visit sometime. I wish you all the best for the rest of your, uh, rest of your week and rest of your day. And uh, thanks for tuning in.